NBA region. Um, our third panelist is Sue Murray. The title of her paper, uh, intersecting with Laura's, is I did, you just didn't listen properly. Storytelling as communal desire in Jolene Phillips' Cheng Cheng Cherries. Our fourth panelist, when she arrives, is Pumla Vipola. The questions Art asks, I'm sorry, so the title of her paper will be The Questions Art Asks Rape the Burden of Knowing and Feminist Imagination. Um, so we have a little bit of a late start, but so presumably does, does everyone else. Um, I, I'm going to ask that people attempt to stay at 15 minutes in case we do have our fourth panelist. Um, and I will do a little five minutes at you. And then we will open up open up for questions. Thank you. So as Helen said, my paper is titled Allowing Me to Speak, Interrogating the Portrayal of Women Through a Feminist Lens in Chat and Cherry's Bedroom. So my presentation is actually an episode from my research paper. Um, and I'll only focus on one of the stories titled. So, Cheng Cheng Cherry is a collection of 13 short stories by Jolyn Phillips, centered on the colorful characters that live in Transpire, a small coastal town between Hermanus and Dallas in the Western Cape. The stories are concerned with the mimetics of rural living, mainly fishing and farming folk, and there is a strong sense of identity between the characters and their location. This community, as a microcosm of South African society, is conventionally patriarchal. And in Irene D. Almeida's words, silence represents the historical mutant of women and the formidable institution known as patriarchy, that form of social organization in which males assume power and create for females an inferior status. This is true for the characters portrayed in Ching Chang Cherries, where women's roles are primarily domestic, including raising children and seeing to the general well-being of their family, while the men are seen to be the income producers for their families. Her story shed light on the complexities of family life, on the way in which people deal with pain and grief, and on the harsh realities that many South Africans face. These harsh realities are explored through the major theme of family trauma, which is prevalent in her stories, as well as themes of familial pride and betrayal. In contemporary South Africa, women are faced with a wide range of issues, such as domestic violence and gender discrimination. These elements are explored in Phillips' stories as she documents their daily trials and tribulations, and by bringing female characters to the forefront of her text, she gives a voice to the voiceless and marginalized women in the community, and therefore allows them to speak. Previously, women struggled from freedom from oppression, for community rights, and for gender equality were largely ignored. However, through focusing on the women in the stories, Phillips enables women to be represented in such a way that they are capable of gaining agency and a place in society. The male characters in most of the stories are portrayed as irresponsible and unfaithful, and thus women form the backbone of the community. Female characters in the stories demand readers' attention, and Phillips possibly does this to address the issues women face, such as being systematically disadvantaged, subdued, and oppressed. The female characters are also the most prominent. Many stories have female narrators who are used to explore the themes of love and compassion, as well as responsibility and fidelity. By choosing not to portray the women as perfect human beings, Phillips enables readers to gain a sense of real lives as well as a realistically drawn community. Using women as the protagonists of most of the stories allows them to gain a voice as they have been marginalized and have had to bear the brunt of social inequality. The opening story in Ching Chang Cherries, The Photograph, features a deceased child, Rocky, and is told from the perspective of his younger sister who attempts to mend her relationship with her parents following his death. The first part of the story is a flashback to 10 years prior to the present narration and is focused <coughs> from the young girl's perspective. <coughs> and the second part is told in the present tense by the same girl, 10 years older, who returns home and finds it has deteriorated. In this emotional opening story of the series of stories, the most prevalent theme is that of family trauma and the latter's effects are mainly shown to manifest in the female characters of the story. The focus on the female characters highlights the common idea throughout the stories that women form the backbone of the community and the responsibility for caring for the family falls on them. The photograph is narrated from a female child's perspective. Through Phillips' use of a child narrator, the honesty and intimacy of the story shines through as the child explains the situation bluntly the way she experiences it. She says, 
When I got ho home, our whole yard was full of people. Even people from HOP land were there. It was probably that stupid brother of mine, I thought to myself. I wish he would just disappear. But Ma almost always takes his side. I stood in the door and watched my Ma sob really loud while Auntie Zin and Auntie Kitty comforted her. She continues to describe how the next day, Ma was up early, cleaning and turning out the house. The house became quiet and that made me feel restless, so I got up. Through the use of a female narrator, issues such as cleaning the home as a stereotypical job of women are highlighted. Activities may, may which, which may not have been noticed by a male child mm -hmm. narrator. Such stereotypical roles for housewives dominate in a patriarchal society. The Vecilovi's suggestion of feminism as a reaction to such stereotypes that deny women positive identity is applicable to the photograph as these stereotypes are highlighted. And so by bringing these roles to light, inequalities such as women being solely responsible for the home and children are noticed and brought to the attention of readers. During the apartheid era, men on farms were paid in alcohol for their labor. This was called the DOP system, while the women remained home caring for the children. This caused turbulence in the home as evident in the photograph. The colored fishing community of Kansbar, as a microcosm of South African society, is patriarchal. The men hold authority within the community as they provide the income for the family, while the women stay home to raise the children. Thus, women are viewed as subordinate and lack independence from their husbands. The child narrator in the photograph recounts her feelings about her parents' relationship. Ugh, I thought. They like gossiping about us because Ma and Dara are always fighting because he is always drunk. The men's irresponsible behavior forces the women to form the backbone of the community, of backbone of the home and in the community at large. By portraying men as irresponsible, Phillips enables the women to gain a greater position and focus in the story and the, agenda, and the gender inequality present within the society is highlighted. Conventional patriarchal societies suggest that women's roles are primarily domestic and emphasize their roles in bearing and raising children. This is a stereotypical belief that a woman's nature is kind, compassionate and loving. However, in the photograph, the character Ma is portrayed differently and she breaks away from the stereotypical norms. Ma struggles to deal with the loss of her son Wapi and as a result, she is distanced to, distant towards her daughter. Quote, I wanted to see Ma. I was sad and Ma always knew how to make me happy. I was scared and it felt like our house was swallowing me. I just leaned my head against her shoulder, but she pushed me away. She looked very angry, her eyes and glasses misty. Go play outside, she said. I stood there frozen, giving her a dead stare. Get out. End quote. Ma behaves differently to the stereotypical woman, so she is positioned outside patriarchal society's norms, and so her character gains depth as her emotions, which contrast with behavioral norms of the patri patriarchal society, such as anger and resentment, are exposed. Patriarchy results in women being viewed as indeterminate beings, highly dependent and voiceless. Ifechilobi challenges this as she, as she says, feminism means a reflection of inferiority and a striving for recognition. It seeks to give the woman a sense of self as a worthy, effectual, and contributing human being. Through creating depth to the character Ma, the stereotypes women are assigned, <coughs> such as behavioral expectations, are brought to light. The story seeks to recognize women's agency and their desire to feel effectual, as well as to have a place and voice within the community, to break away from the patri patriarchal structure of society. Characters such as Ma, Wapi, and the female child narrator recur in multiple stories in Ching Chang series. This allows for readers to gain insight into the family as a whole, and in a broader sense, presents the idea of a strong and united female community. Phillips uses personal history as a story, as she notes when she says that many of her friends and family members mention that they see themselves in her stories and wonder if they inspired them. This comment highlights the unity of the community and the ways in which Phillips gives a voice to the voiceless woman in the community. Further, the composition of the stories mimics the natural disorder of everyday life and the stories echo themes from one another, highlighting the sense of community and the fact that members of the community rely on one another. This is evident in both the photograph and the seventh story in Phillips's collection titled Hannah where extended family members and neighbors help the family as they see fit.
The ending of the story wraps up its themes of family trauma, pride and irresponsibility in terms of alcohol abuse on the part of the male character. Ma emerges as a gentler and more loving character than she was throughout the story, which highlights the love and compassion generally associated with mothers. As Ma reminisces, she says, you know, he really did love you, your brother. He would other you on his back. The day I brought you home, he looked at you all the time with his little legs hanging from the bed kicking, and he'd kiss you on your little forehead. As the story ends, there is a hint at the possibility of reconciliation between Ma and the narrator, and they are arguably more optimistic for a happier future in their relationship as they talk and laugh, something they have not previously done. Despite the traumatic experience the family has been through, the story ends on a positive note with Ma and her daughter laughing together. It could also be argued that, that the narrator has succeeded in mending her relationship with Ma, as they have both healed from their past trauma. Yeah, she says, I miss you, rubbing over my face and Rocky's face on the photo. This also reveals the gender and gentle and loving characteristics of Ma towards her children. Often, being a voice to the voiceless can be seen to be speaking on their behalf when they already have a voice, and resultantly reinforces their voicelessness. Conversely, speaking only of their resilience and failing to mention their hardships means ignoring the reality of their suffering. However, in Ching Chang Cherries, Phillips creates a balance between both sides of the debate as she speaks of both hardships as well as their resilience, as she gives intimate and sensory details of her characters. Phillips, Phillips notes that, although I have written a short story collection, the poem found me and not the other way around. I find that one should just write the truth and your stories will mold into the shape they need. I had 13 different lives, and although from the same cut of landscape, they wanted to be given a moment that was only theirs. While she can be seen to be speaking on their behalf, she allows all 13 characters a unique moment in her stories, and thus a balance is established between speaking for them and representing them in such a way that they are capable of gaining agency and a place in society. In conclusion, Phillips's short story collection is a body of knowledge about the everyday lives of the Khanswai community, with a specific focus on the daily trials women face. The Khanswai community is conventionally patriarchal. However, Phillips privileges female characters and voices in her stories, and introduces voices that have long been ignored by the literary canon. Whilst Phillips portrays her female characters by the stereotypical image of, of subdued, voiceless, and subservient, she also challenges these stereotypes by allowing her female characters <coughs> to form the central focus of her stories, and in so doing, liberates her female characters from the marginal status and gives the voice to the voices. Next up is the paper the, by Douglas Thomas, the Lingiers, Lingiers. Lingiers Jihad, re-examining historical women's agency in the Senegambia region. Would you like me to flash you five minutes and one minute? Or yeah, that works. Before? My mouth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my paper is, um, I'll just give you all a little bit of history. I um, submitted this paper to the Journal of Women's History, and they rejected it because they didn't even send it out to editors, which, which made me mad, <laughs> hurt my feelings. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the reason why they didn't because it didn't have enough. They said it didn't have any feminist theory. It's just it's history. So I was like, what do, what do I need feminist theory for? This is a history journal, right? So she said, since I didn't reference certain people, then they didn't even send it out. Well, I was, of course, I felt justified when it was accepted for this conference, <laughs> and uh, because this is a feminist conference, the the issue here is, and this is why I thought it was perfect for this conference when it said the muted shall speak. The issue here is that the historians have muted the voice of this woman in in this history, and I I was not happy about that. So let, let me just give you a brief breakdown of the story. There is this jihad coming out of uh, the Mauritania area 
spreading throughout the Senegambia region into all these these kingdoms. And the kingdom that I'm dealing with is called the kingdom of Keijo, or Keijo, if you know who you ask. In Keijo, they have a dual gender authority, authority system where you have a male ruler and you have a female ruler. And the, the male ruler dies. His mother was the female ruler, which is the Lenghe. And his cousin takes his place. So his cousin goes against the constitution, removes his aunt from being the Lenghe, chooses his own mother to the consternation of the royal council and everybody else involved. So, but she didn't take it lying down. She saw this jihad coming and she allied with one of the jihadists, gave her daughter in marriage to him, got her army and her son's uh, army with this man's army, which was too weak to take over the kingdom, put them together, they take over the kingdom. The guy, the jihadist wants to rule the kingdom. She says, no. She said, my nephew. So she chose another nephew to rule it. And he converts to Islam, you know, to make the compromise correct. And then some of the jihadist uh, disciples catch him drinking some alcohol. So they kill him. She gets mad, calls another nephew. She has a lot of nephews. Who is a leader of another kingdom and tell him, come in, take over, because these jihadists are not going to have this kingdom. And he comes in, he takes over, kills the guy, and he he's the ruler of both of those kingdoms, and she retains her space as Lingesh. So I'm looking at the secondary sources, because I actually got the primary sources to write about something else. I was going to write about a king. And um, I said, well, why nobody talks about this woman? What is What is going on? And I looked at the secondary uh, sources, their sources, and I said, maybe they didn't have the same sources that I have. They all did. They all, including one of them was a woman, chose to ignore the role of this woman, this woman in writing about this particular jihadic episode. So that made me mad. I said, well, that ain't right. And, I, and because I'm not a feminist scholar, I didn't include any feminist uh, theory but I think everything that everybody does is important. So everything that a woman does is important, whether she's acting in a traditional gender role or not. And everything a man does is important. So why are we excluding the woman in this, in this particular episode where she's the main character? That didn't sit well with me, so I wrote a paper about it. And here it is. So before I, uh, that's, the, that's pretty much the central part of my paper. I'm just going to give you a little bit more about Lingair because it, it differs from what we think of in the Western tradition of authority, where you have a single male ruler and his wife is pretty much there for women dressing. Um, so in Keio, royal authority is exercised by the Damu, which is the king, and the Linger, which is the female ruler. This is not unique to Keio. Sarah kingdoms of Sin and Salum, the Wolof kingdoms of Wallo, Jolof, and Bawa, and, and several kingdoms throughout Africa have this, this setup. I know they had it in um, Rwanda and Burundi. So, it changes a little bit, but it's always the, the male, because the, the ruler is chosen from his matriarchal, his matrilineal uh, family and his patrilineal line. You have to be, if, you, if you're going to be king, you have to match up. Both of your family <coughs> lines have to be from a royal group. And the, the lingia comes from your matrilineal uh, family, and it's the oldest living member of your matrilineal family that's able to rule. And you put her in his place. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, more about who Alinga is. It's here I write. All the kingdoms of the region had Alinga. She had to be a, oh, the, the Damal had to be a patrilineal and, and royal matrilineal lich, And the Alinga was from his matrilineal lich. Uh, the Alinga was also more than a symbol. She was a member of the Royal Council, had the authority to convene the Royal Council. Her opinion was a counterweight to that of the Sovereign. And I use the term Sovereign, which she wasn't really Sovereign because they ruled together. She also had an army comprised of her slave soldiers and clients, as well as fighting members of the Matra Client. She had an income derived from a province in the kingdom which paid taxes directly to her. She was the head of all the women of the kingdom, thusly as the man went to the Sovereign or his appointees when there was a problem, the Lingar presided over all the issues involving women. The Lingar is not a queen. Queens are the wives of kings in the Western monarchical system. Their power is ceremonial except in certain circumstances, and their power is dependent upon their husbands. 
If a king allows his wife to have power, she has it. Otherwise, her power is in her ability to produce sons to sit on the throne after her husband is dead. If a queen's husband dies leaving an underage heir, she can act as a guide for a young for him through a though a man is always chosen as the regent. If a king dies leaving only female heirs, then his daughters can become a queen with the same powers and rights of the king. And I argue, but in that case they become socially male. <coughs> An example would be Queen Elizabeth I. That her 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 courtiers always referred to her as sir. And um because she was a social male even though she was the, the clearly a woman. The Lingere is, they say, in the European monarchy there is no place for the woman sharing power with a man. The Lingere is not a queen mother, though this term is often used to describe such a position. The queen mother is the mother of the sitting monarch in the European system. She has no power beyond the ceremonial. Her status is lower than that of her son's wife, who is the sitting queen. Queen mothers are respected, and her level of actual power is dependent on how much the sitting <coughs> monarch allows her to have. The linger is the other half of power in a dual gender system of authority that is practiced in various manners throughout Africa. As such, the linger is the mother of the kingdom. And I go on to talk about the ideology of motherhood that Rihanna and Stevens write about in her history of African motherhood. Now, I'm going to go back up and give this other quote from Fatou Kamara who writes about why this system was set up. She writes, life, fertility, and prosperity are born of an alliance between the masculine and the feminine. Instead of being opposed to one another, the two genders are partnered with the goal of realizing harmony and success. As in the image of the earth and sky, the sun and the moon, dryness and wetness, the man and the woman, the sexual pairs, are the motors of life and the source of equilibrium on earth as, it is, as in the cosmos. Using this concept, a woman can be the sole head of a state, as in the image of the primordial mother, progenitor of the world who gave earth, birth to the first couple. However, a lone man embodying sterility must partner with a woman in order to have a prosperous reign. So that's the philosophical underpinning of this uh, complementarity that uh, they use for their, for their uh, governmental system. And finally, because I'm tired of talking, y'all acting like y'all tired of hearing me. <laughs> y'all get all quiet, I ain't used to all that. The dual, the dual gender system also allowed the exposition of skills to be utilized in home, expression of women's concerns, and by extension that of their children, and the effective completion of the adequate authority for all of society through a complementary authority structure. These women in these roles are usually older because age is treasured in African societies and cultures. And usually women past menopause are seen as treasures of wisdom because they have surpassed the, in quotes, so don't y'all get mad, the weakness of womanhood, which is the menstrual cycle in pregnancy. So, all I wanted, uh, my point in writing this paper was to point out this woman was valuable. And I think that the previous writers dismissed her and didn't talk about her because they didn't see the importance of her role in the kingdom first and they're working from a european uh, perspective so that makes sense a western perspective and secondly because they rely more <coughs> on the uh writings of the european writers and the arab writers who totally dismissed her also so that's it And we'll have Sue, Samare, and her. The title of the paper I did. You just didn't listen properly. Storytelling as communal desire in Jolin. 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 Jolin's, Jolin Phillips, Ching Chang Ching. Okay. Um, there's going to be a bit of overlap with <coughs> Laura, obviously, because we're talking about the same text. <coughs> Jolin Phillips is quasi autobiographical debut collection, Ching Chang Cherries and Other Stories, creates a composite portrait of the close knit but economically depressed coloured fishing village of Panspai in Western Cape. Relayed in English, intermingled with the distinctive local African Afrikaans, sorry, dialect of the characters themselves, the thirteen stories are predominantly narrated from the first person perspective. 
and focus on the emotional experiences and daily trials and tribulations of women who attempt to assert a sense of agency against the backdrop of financial insecurity, patriarchal and parochial community values, and deep-seated but often vexed <coughs> family bonds. As Diane Orbeck remarks, the themes of Ching Chang Cherry center on responsibility and fidelity, mostly for the female characters who bear the brunt of social inequality. For example, in many of the stories, women in particular shoulder the burden of caring not only for their immediate families, but also for relatives or members of the community whose own families have deserted them. Moreover, <coughs> the community is also ravaged by alcoholism induced by privation and the iniquitous dog system, an affliction which leads to premature deaths, fetal alcohol syndrome, and arrested development, and to neglect, remorse, and despair. Despite this apparently bleak scenario, however, the stories are infused with humor and warmth. They focus on women's resilience in the face of the fecklessness and infidelity of men, and sometimes the irresponsibility of other women too. The petty but amusing jealousies and resentments that are fueled by communal gossip and meddling. Found experiences of love, betrayal, and lust that are at odds with self-righteous Christian pieties. Shameful family secrets concealed by a brave veneer of respectability and self-pride, and the effort required to choose between resignation or defeat, and resistance or resilience. Deceptively simple on the surface, each of the narratives offers wryly comic and ironic insights into the realities of heartache, adversity, <coughs> adversity and disillusionment. But they often end on a note which affirms the redemptive possibilities of healing and reconciliation of telling or speaking rather than silence and muteness. In generic terms, Ching Chang Cherries is a conventional short story cycle grounded in a representation of the nexus between identity, community, and place. A cycle which, though it presents idiosyncratic voices and narratives, ultimately features a community persona larger than the sum of its parts. If, as Ian Reid asserts, the sense of community usually permeates a cycle linking story to story, and if community with its attendant sense of place, geographical, cultural, and social, and personal identity are irrevocably linked, then this is especially true of Phillips's collection. As she herself admits, I'm stitched together by my neighbors, my friends, and family. Funspy is where I learn to dream and tell stories the way I do. The effect of Ching Chang Cherries as a whole, then, is to send a complex message about the relationship between individual and collective identity. The emergent group focus implies an aesthetic and a definition of realism that privilege community and place, the issue of culture itself at the center of the narrative. Moreover, Phillips's decision to link her stories in such a way as to convey a sense of the coherent multiplicity of community and a sense of place, her attachment to the natural environment and the people of Hans by self-evident, illustrates the contention that in the history of the short story cycle genre, the most persistent continuity in the form has been in setting, so that all of the shorter works constituting a cycle occur in the same general location, with prominent landmarks recurring throughout, tying the events to an enduring sense of place. The strong association of the short story cycle with regionalism is thus a function of the fact that many cycles locate their unity of place in some rural region, and this topographical unity lends itself to evocation of details of local color, which, if successfully used, strengthen the setting by adding to the impression of actuality. As Valerie Shaw points out, the device of grouping tales and stories set in the same location creates a persuasive effect of realism and enables the reader to become acclimatized to conditions in a circumscribed locality and so become familiar with a particular way of life. In Ching Chang Cherries, the reader's sense of the authenticity and realism of the stories is enhanced by repeated references to recognizable landmarks and features, such as the old and new harbors in the fish factory at Kwan Spai, the mountains and farms in the hinterland, the nearby towns of Hermanus, Stanford, Wellington, Willowdale, Caledon, and the Darsdorp, and actual neighborhoods, street names, and small business establishments and drinking holes in Kwan Spai. Um, some examples would be Halun Scheme, um, the ironically named Beverly Hills Blackersdorf, um, Strandlooper Street, the Andres Cafe, and Blue Whale Canteen. <coughs> Allusions to familiar South African products and consumer items such as Colgate Apple Shampoo, BB Tobacco, Chomps and 7-Up Chocolate, Omo Washing Powder, and Country Fresh Ice Cream also contribute to the verisimilitude of the story and their groundedness in a very specific milieu. 
More significantly, however, in terms of their representation of the intersubjective entanglements of a specific community, the stories are linked by the occurrence of certain characters, both major and minor. For example, in the opening story, the one that Laura discussed, the photograph, the narrator Joni Felicity Gibson returns home from teacher <coughs> training college to belatedly discover that her mother mourns her departure from the family home as much as she does the death of Varpi, Joni's brother who died 10 years earlier. Joni herself felt guilty, resentful and rejected at the time of Varpi's death, believing that he was her mother's urhapo. Now, however, she discovers her mother poring over an old photograph of her two children, fixing her eyes on it like she is trying to copy every detail in her mind. When Joni asks Ma, um, do you still miss him? Her mother rubs her fingers over both of their faces. Yeah, I miss you, she says poignantly. The implication being that her children were equally precious to her and that, as she has emphasized earlier, she never treated them as fists in flesh. Um, the pathos of the story as a fictionalized autobiographical reworking of Phillips's own life history is underlined by her dedication of Ching Chang Cherries in the frontispiece to, quote, my brother Varpi, whose death shook me to life, and for Mama and Dera, the pulse of this book, um, the link which is perhaps confirmed by the similarity between the names Jolan and Joni. Um, and um, Joni in the story calls her parents Mama and Dera. Um, in Hannah, the seventh story in the collection, the unnamed narrator, Na, resents the fact that her mother is unable to tell her that Hannah, the chubby child in a 56-year-old woman's body whom they've taken under their wing, has died, but senses that this is because her mother is still grieving the death of her own child. She thinks, I was angry about that, thought that maybe it was because of Varpi that she didn't want to talk about death and dying. Um, at Hannah's funeral, the narrator and her mother, Delian, once again encounter Auntie Charmaine, who has Hannah's money from Uliedo Auntie Lena, Charmaine's mother and both Delian and Hannah's surrogate mother at an earlier point. Charmaine has appropriated Auntie Lena's house and has been gambling her part of the latter's estate away. At the graveside, <coughs> after Delian has rejected Charmaine's attempt to give her Hannah's inheritance, and she says, Erfgeld to Swerfgeld, which means inheritance money, results in wandering or roaming or drifting. Um, she accidentally knocks off Charmaine's dark glasses, only to discover that Charmaine has a big blue poop or hood. In other words, is a victim of domestic abuse. Shocked though she is at this discovery, Delian instructs her daughter in the unspoken codes of family solidarity and discretion. Our business is our business, she says. In both the photograph and Hannah, then, there are clumsy but ultimately hopeful overtures to bring about reconciliation, and a deeper truth is revealed. Family loyalties override petty animosities and discord. In The Pair of Glasses and The Funeral Singer, two consecutive stories in the collection which Phillips has indicated initially comprised a single story, the narrator protagonist Floki or Lily, her sister Letitia or Sissy, and the Oma Aleta and Oprah Dani also recur together with Auntie Marta, whom Lely terms his second wife, and Omar derogatively, derogatively labels your mate. Although Marta is only briefly mentioned in the first story, she features more prominently in the second. In the former, that is the pair of glasses, Lely has been hiding the fact that she is not a slow learner, but has poor eyesight from her school and from her family. A visit from a class teacher and the Domini's subsequent intervention mean that she has prescribed a big, a big, thick pair of big, thick glasses that look like a kaleidoscope, too heavy for my face to carry. Looking at herself in the mirror, she notes, I look funny, but it doesn't bother me, I can see. Though she is ridiculed by Sissy, who describes her spectacles as Coke glasses, she knows that ugly though they may be, they empower her. I'm going to be clever. Being able to see after so many years of hiding that I couldn't is the best part of me, and I won't let anyone ruin it. In the second story, the funeral singer Lily is again the first person narrator. She comes to realize that Oma's feisty, feisty response to her opa's infidelity with Marta, according to her sister Sissy, Oma invited Marta for tea and then forcibly and scandalously pulled out the latter's scum house, that is her pubic hair. <laughs> covers an irremediable um, heartache that only expresses itself when she plays the piano. As Lily observes, when Oma gets sad, she sits in front of the piano and plays the soft keys that feel like the music could go on forever. I know she plays for a lot of things, her heart's here. 
Though she does not know how to comfort her grandmother, she asks her to teach her how to play like you, at which her own smile becomes so forever and forever. Though Lily does not grasp the irony embedded in her request, playing like Oma, in other words, means experiences the latter sense of abandonment. She nevertheless thinks to herself that everything will turn out for the best soon enough. Okay, there are a number of other recurring characters which I'm going to go over um, very briefly. Um, Scarol is introduced in Lily <coughs> Lilith, which is apparently about an ugly dog, but turns out to be about a man who has disappeared. Um, Phillips explains that this was a man in the community who did disappear. Um, but he then is a major protagonist in the later story, The Legend of Ching Chang Cherries. And other characters such as Ati or Maurabal appear in a number of stories and Um Yapi. Indeed, most of the stories feature a seemingly endless network of worms and aunties, members of the extended and um, intermarried families whose livelihoods center on the local fishing and farming industries. Um, as Carr and Shimko comments then, what the stories have in common is the endlessly messy business of being in relation to people, particularly in a small community where everyone's business is everyone else's. As a number of reviewers, reviewers have remarked, the most striking aspect of Ching Chang Cherries is the Afrikaans um, or coloured idiolect or patwa that her characters employ. Meg van der Merwe, for example, comments that one of the outstanding and original points is Jolin's voice. There's more than just the account of an underrepresented facet of society. There is also polylingualism operating where a fusion of English and Afrikaans occurs. The voice carries with it the timbre and melody of Afrikaans. However, the particular brand of Afrikaans at issue here is particularly racy, rude, coarse, and colorful, the all words which have been used to describe it. Thomas Diane Arbuck remarks, Philip trots out carefully brutal idioms, as is evident in terms of phrases Sit ye op die pole, makey. In other words, are you pregnant when you're sitting on the pole? Um so a pisang, eight so a pineapple. The penis goes in like a banana. The baby comes out like a pineapple. And vechle air from, from a white man, a discarded white man's egg. Nevertheless, Phillips does not generally translate Afrikaans words into English, nor does she foreground their foreignness by the use of italics or possibly provided glossary. As she herself explains, I was trying to translate the people rather than the language. Something about the people, the way the people speak is more than just the words. I wanted the rhythm to come through. As I wrote, it sounded out, I sounded it out loud, keeping words that sounded like a kind of cultural translation. It is as a result of Philip's linguistic fidelity to his subjects and the story's air of oral immediacy that commentators on Ching Chang Cherries have made such expansive claims as that she gives voice to the voiceless, that she brings across voices never heard before in South African English, and that her stories give a voice to a South African community too long ignored by the literary canon. However, although a tradition exists of South African oral styles, short story cycles which though written in English deal specifically with Afrikaans speaking communities and aim to capture the textures and cadences of the language as it is spoken, what interests me here is Philip's particular concern to capture muted or marginalized voices in the contemporary post-apartheid moment and the South African literary landscape. Again, this concern reflects, arguably this concern reflects her own position as a writer initially literally silenced by the alien Englishness of Cape Town. As she remarks in an interview, I came here, that is to UWC on a Mandela Road scholarship to study against my parents' wishes, which I now know were based on immense fear for their daughter and my tongue that just refused to fit in with the language landscape here in Cape Town, which literally left me tongue-tied so that I would like to argue that perhaps the stories originated from a place of finding a voice and a magnitude of stories I've always had that helped me to sing again. It's thus significant that a number of specifically female characters in the stories are portrayed as pursuing an education, often, often against various obstacles, such as their mother's more circumscribed wishes. And this pursuit distances them or alienates them from family, community, and friends. And I'm thinking of journey of Lida, Pluan, and Lili in a number of the stories. Um, but the sense of in-betweenness has been generally identified as characterizing post-colonial cycles which negoti negotiate dislocated or diasporic cultural identities. Um, for example, 
um, James Nagel asserts that the story sequence offers a vital technique for the exploration and depiction of the complex interactions of gender, ethnicity, and individual identity, and that this is because of its capacity to, to embody hybridity or cultural duality and to represent, indeed, in its very structure, the form, both compositely and singularly, the complex interweavings of identity, community, and place. However, um, Bertha D. Wong notes that the cycle has a particular appeal to women of color who seem to return to local roots, family, community, and ethnicity as sources of personal identity, political change, and creative expression. Telling one's story or the story of one's people as an act of self-definition and cultural continuance is a strong collective impulse. And I'm going to end there. Can I come to the end? Um, this is a quote that we recover a sense of connection only when we attend to each other's narratives <coughs> and affirm the communal desire of storytelling. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, hopefully, you'll have a chance to pick up the last bit okay. during the question. <laughs> Lastly, we have you. Okay. Do you need to do something? Yes, please. Okay, lastly, we have Pumla Gola, whose paper is titled The Questions Art Asks Rape, the Burden of Knowing and Feminist Imagination. How do I move it from here? Please, can I? Which one is it? It's. Oh, you're right. Oh, if I move it. Oh, that's a good method. Sorry. I know. Do you mind? My paper's called um, the, question, the Questions Art Ask, well no, The Question Art Asks, Rape the Burden of Knowing and Feminist Imagination. And um, I'm going to speak to it rather than read it because it's a very long paper, so I'm going to try and um, rush through some parts and then hopefully spend a little bit more time on parts that really um, matter. Um, I, the paper comes out of my grappling with the complications of voice, visibility, and feminist imagination. Um, and trying to kind of, my apologies, okay. and overlapping sensibilities. Um, and as a way to use a language that speaks meaningfully and productively um, to the intellectual and creative genealogies I'm interested in talking about. Recognizing, of course, that we all inherit various, you know, part of our training into the disciplines means that we inherit certain kinds of things which, which, do, which help us do great work, but would also sometimes hamper us depending on what it is we want to do. So my training is in English literary studies. Um, oh, wait. Sorry. Okay. So it starts then from a set of intersecting frustrations and dissatisfactions. The and I'll name three specific ones. The first one is around what a feminist movement or what feminist presence looks like in, in, in scholarship. So kind of pervasive notions of what, of, 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 of the thing we can call feminist movement, what it looks like. So for example, very often in post-apartheid um, Southern Africa, this gets articulated as a recurring frustration in the public and, and, and scholarly imagination that says, where's the post-apartheid feminist movement. Oh, where's the glorious Zimbabwean feminist movement? There is no feminist movement in Southern Africa. We need, right? So that, which, which I think is, a, is, is inaccurate, but so that's the one kind of frustration and dissatisfaction, which intersects then secondly with a separation um, that I inherit and I think many of us inherit between how we talk through feminist expression in texts and sites, depending on whether we are scholars of the creative, whether we are literary scholars, film scholars, art historians and art critics, um, musicologists, on the, uh, theater critics on the one hand, 
and, and, and sociologists and anthropologists of the other, right? So this historic, this, this, this created um, notion that between, between what, in, in, in what, what Angelo Fick likes to call um, the disciplines that study text and the disciplines that study people. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know, so kind of the, the, the yes. So, a, 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 so, so the first frustration then is this frustration with this notion of how, how do we recognize a feminist presence in the world? What are the lenses we use? And, 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 and a dissatisfaction with what the inherited lenses allow us not to see, what they obscure, as much as they, they ostensibly are about highlighting certain things, um, are in fact very often precisely what allows us to claim highly inaccurately that there is no post-apartheid feminist southern African feminist movement. The second one, and as I said, this, this, this inherited separation in our very attempt to, to read and theorize it and, and make sense of what we see, that we inherit through this notion then of these, of these disciplinary and enclaves um, between you know, the disciplines, those of us training the disciplines that um, study text, and therefore you study text in certain ways and you can get certain kinds of information by studying people which are very different kinds. So we can all be feminist scholars, but the assumption is that in fact much of the work that we do, that many of the tools we use in fact cannot help us work across that. We can talk about across those boundaries conceptually but not analytically. And the third frustration and dissatisfaction, so all of these intersect, so the third one is, of course, around enduring inscriptions, which is to say canonical inscriptions, of where theory resides and emanates from. Now, I'm just going to go through these, and then I'm not going to say anything, and then I'll come back to it. Now, ostensibly, These texts, these sites, these bodies, these kinds of historic, creative, cultural production are not supposed to be studied in the same kind of way. Mm -hmm. Right? If I'm studying these kinds of texts, I'm supposed to use a certain kind of series of, of, of skill sets which allow me to harness certain kinds of information which these kinds of texts cannot read, right? This is part of the so this is part this is part of, of the inherent this is part of the dissatisfaction and, 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 and frustration. So that's the one set. But of course, in addition to this, we inherit very often a very specific language of speaking about feminism in the world, which I'm just gonna rush through. Um, which is itself also traps us in certain kinds of things. So the language of talking about feminism in the world relies on a universalizing framework of feminism through waves, so, right, in scholarship, right? What are the waves? Very quickly. The first wave, the suffragettes, women's access to political and economic power. This narrative often speaks from historically global, no specific articulations of movements. Mm -hmm. But it pretends to speak about the globe. Mm -hmm. The second wave, sexual revolution, reproductive rights, often uses shorthand of the 1960s and 1970s moments in the global north. Mm -hmm. The third wave, intersectionality as race, sexual orientation, class, religion, geography are accepted as always shaping women's experiences. This wave is about moving away from a universal understanding of women, we are told, um, we're taught, to that of women, all shaped by multiple systems of power all the time. And, and therefore a, 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 a more layered, different understanding of how gender works, and then post-feminism, which is either a critique of feminism or an ironic feminism, depending on which set of texts on post-feminism you index. Now, of course, there are benefits to this, to this inheritance, right? So I'm not saying, I'm saying it's not particularly useful for, our, for, for what I'm trying to do, but it's not, it's not without use. Historically, there are benefits to speaking about ways or an anti-patriarchal project. It resists, waves resist the logic of chrono chronological time and human improvement development as plotted against a tidy graph and or, or linear progression 
To show instead a movement and an understanding of time as complex, so waves resist this. Speaking of waves, of feminism through waves, also of course values fluidity rather than the rigid rigidity of father time and master narratives in hard and social sciences historically. It highlights overlaps, shifts, and predictability. It centers women's lived experiences, different sites of knowledge and insight. It recognizes that patriarchal frameworks cannot work well to speak about anti-patriarchal sensibility. It places accent on constant movement, reflection, and possibility, rather than what had until then been accepted as evolutionary or developmental mapping and flattening um, ways of, of, of dealing with knowledge. The problems for our context and others of speaking about waves is that it universalizes a specific history of women's anti-patriarchal organizing and presents it as a model for speaking about all feminist type articulations across time and across the globe. Although this notion of waves was designed to resist universalizing, because universalizing is oppressive and even the most conservative feminism recognizes that universalizing is oppressive, the concept does the work of universalizing. Universalizing erases histories that do not fit the framework proposed. So the first, second, third wave takes on a timeline despite the initial attempts or intentions to resist timelines. It <coughs> pretends also that women of color, black women, working class women of different races, queer women in the global North context were not always problematizing normative constructions of women. Whereas, of course, we know that women of color, Native American and black, Afri black U.S. women were writing critiques of how the white women suffragettes were constructing women as early as the 19th century and before. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I think our time's been cut. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, because <laughs> I'm racing through the boring but important part. In colonial contexts, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, women's resistance to colonialism was always intersectional, i.e. third wave, long before third wave happened. These women were organizing as colonized women, African women, women in liberation movements, and keenly aware of race, class, gender, and geography. In settler colonies, the movement for the vote was very conflicted and divided on race. So white women, for example, won the vote in Rhodesia in the Union of South Africa, but this was the vote for white women at the expense of black women and black men. The same can be seen in Asian comparative colonial context. Histories of these movements then make it impossible to apply first wave, second wave, third wave here. It constructs a very specific idea of what a woman's movement looks like and is inadequate to recognize even radical feminist organizing in Latina, Chicana, African feminist, and Asian feminist contexts. I use feminist imagination here rather than feminist movement to recognize all of the above, as well as to think about feminist expression in creative, cultural, suggestive modes, as well as explicitly activist political spheres together. So to think about this kind of work and this kind of work in the same moment as engaged in conversation rather than as existing in silos. To rethink how difference matters, not as divisive, but as a source of power and value to embrace contestation in different aspects of feminist consciousness, to see feminisms that overlap, contest, flow into each other and disrupt in different ways, to disrupt, to trouble the division between sites of abstraction and sites of raw material, and to pay attention to how creative cultural texts, sites and performances produce transformative conceptual vocabulary. To interrogate, in other words, what Desiree Lewis argues, and I do too, as does Charlene Khan and Ndombe um, Dombela in different contexts that we argue consistently, that the creative theorizes. But what does this mean for the ways in which we understand feminist pre presence, theorization, movement, visibility, and presence in ways that are generated from the context within which we operate? Um, and I use, which now was supposed to be the part that I spent the most time on, so I use four key African feminist concepts to try, and I read and I, and I, and I use these alongside um, Gabrielle Goliath's um, faces of, sorry, now faces of war um, exhibition. So what does it mean to think about, you know, Susan Andrade, who's a literary scholar, um, 
speaks about how it is important to think about rioting women as writing women. And I think I'm, uh, that's the one that I'll to think about here, that even though we're trained to think traditionally of, of, of writing women as women who organize and who make policy and who are in the streets as doing something very different from, for example, women working in the African feminist novel tradition. And what happens if we think about them as, the as, as occupying the same space or spaces that are conversational? The example I like to use when I teach this to my student is to say, well, think about Gucci Emicheta. In fact, if we think about writing women and writing women as separate things, it requires that we imagine that Gucci Emicheta who marches, who builds publishing initiatives in, 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 in Black Britannia and in Nigeria is a very different thing from the, and sociologist, is a very different entity from the Gucci Emicheta who's also a novelist. Mm -hmm. Right? That in fact, this division does not make sense. It requires that we do a certain violence in order to do, to do, to do, to do this work. Um, and Susan Andrade's, of course, um, kind of conceptualization um, forces us or invites us to think about writing women as writing women and writing women as, 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 as writing. To think about that work as writing, the public work as writing, and to think about it as theoretical work. What does it mean to answer, it helps me answer the question of, 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 of how the mute speaks, which I'm not going to talk about because this entire conference is, is named after that. <laughs> also, Toller's notion of the shouting silent, which is not quite the same as, 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 as Mutsimez, the mute always speaks, but which also comes out of, of, of Sitole's filmography, Sitole being um, the most decorated South African um, uh, documentary filmmaker, socialist feminist filmmaker, um, and her first and her most, her most famous film being Shouting Silent, where she talks about this notion of how do we talk about what is the shouting um, silent, right? So it's not, it's it, okay. And then of course, Habiba Baderun's notion of ambiguous visibility, um, incredibly useful for me to think about, and I'm, this is the last thing I'm going to say now, to think about, to think about, and to think through, and to think alongside Gabrielle Goliath's um, exhibition Faces of War, which makes sense of or tries to develop a language to think about and to think through rape, um, through, the, through, through, through the imagination of unknowing. And so this exhibition, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, I promise you, uh, <laughs> This exhibition, which was at the Goodman and has been at several other places, um, she has several photographs. She also has moving, so moving, um, so she has video footage. So these are all screens. Um, and they all and, and these are all kind of so okay so these are all photographs which have been modified so that to create symmetry um, so one side of the face has been has been doubled um, and these are moving images of of violence and and, and, and gender violence what is interesting about this, what, what this exhibition is that all of these women and men and 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 well yes Women and men in, in this in this in this exhibition in the in the video footage are speaking. We cannot hear what they say. Mm. They're not silent. You can hear something. You simply cannot make out what they say. So they say it sounds a bit like, and they're speaking. And so it isn't silence, mm. right? You can see them moving, and you and you and you strain to hear what they're saying because there is sound and there's discomfort, and you can hear all sorts of things except their words. But as you are looking at them, as in the photographs, the treatment on the, on, of, of the glass is such that it also acts as a mirror. So you see your face. Mm. And so the, 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 the struggle is to tell who, it, and, and it's subtitles, faces of people who may or may not be victims or perpetrators of gender violence. Mm. <laughs> right? And so you strain to be able to tell the perpetrators from the victims, and you strain to take yourself out of the image, except you know, uh, uh, Goliath has, has manipulated both the, 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 the frames and the screens so that it's in fact impossible for you not to see your own face and to be constantly disturbed in the case of these faces with what something is not quite right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of working with, with this notion of, um, so working in the feminist tradition as, as much of Goliath's work, 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 work does, but also in many ways asking questions. You know, we, um, in ways I think that, 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 that does conceptually the same kind of work that Baderun is doing when she coins not just ambiguous visibility but also her very powerful notion that comes out of the poetry um, of leaking meanings um, 
or you know the shouting, the shouting silence. So it isn't, it isn't, it is a silence that isn't quite a silence, mm -hmm. and it is, a, and it is a visibility that that we cannot take for granted because because in fact it often does the work of invisibilizing, even as it hypervisualizes. Um, it allows me to think then about this work alongside, for example, the work of various public work, the silent protest, um, these kinds of okay. Um, the one in nine silent protests and die-ins versus sit-ins and various other things um, in ways that are not conceptually antagonistic to what Gabriel Goliath is doing, for example. Goliath's Faces of War um, exhibition is an intertextual exhibition that foregrounds the value of questions and resisting certainty in approaches to gender-based violence, but also to think about what visible, what feminist movement, feminist imagination, feminist visibility, feminist presence might look like. Um, and I think all of these places that are not supposed to be speaking to each other are in fact in, and so this is part of this long paper, but also the book project that it, that, it, that, it, that, it, that it is part of, is an attempt to make sense of what those can be, can, oh, um, play around, in fact, with what some of those disjunctures um, and, 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 and eruptions and leakings um, and ambiguities. Um, in fact, produce. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a round or two of questions. Uh, could we immediately get into it? Questions, comments? Oh, you see? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, <coughs> wow. Sorry, must I stand? If you don't, well, whatever. I won't do so. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much, Uma. Because, no, no, because <laughs> of this. Because we struggle with this whole thing around um, practice versus theorizing, materiality versus representation. Um, and we struggle with naming. And I'd like to, for you to speak to me about the, the naming practices, right? And the ways in which the naming and the constructions of genealogy, right? Genealogy, genealogy, right? Around the erasure of naming. So I, I've always, you know, people say, feminism, you know, I you know, came to Africa somehow, okay? But my grandmother's a feminist, never said the word, right? And so how, and I think Talisa was speaking about it this morning, about how then we, you find yourself and you find a different sort of voice when you get outside of the names. Um, and with that in mind, I'd also like to ask a question to Douglas around, how do we theorize erasure um, and question historiography um, around, um, this particular historical person, um, you know, figure, without feminist theory. I mean, I, I was, it, it struck me right at the beginning. Like, what, what is it then? Okay. Okay, thank you, Pulo. I think that, you know, I, 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 I well, it, it's a question, but it isn't really a question, right? It's kind of a, a, a reflection. So I, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, there's frustration about 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 names and genealogies, um, and 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 of course, as you as you as you rightly point out, that genealogies and names don't just I mean, you know they, they, they don't describe they 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 perform right. So the constant saying African feminism came to Africa is making it come to Africa, right? It's not describing the reality, right? Whatever the reality is. Um, and so I think part of what this helps me to do, so for example, is to just, I think that for a, a big part of the problem for me with the, with the, with the ways it just it requires a cutting up that isn't productive um, for the kind of messiness. So it creates some kind of messiness, but it doesn't create the kind of messiness that's productive for the kind of work we're trying to do, right? Or at least the trying, kind of work that I'm trying to do, right? And it requires a certain mutilation, really. Um, of, 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 it requires two things. It requires a mutilation in service of loyalty to the ways in which we've been trained and disciplined mm -hmm. 
into certain types of scholarship. But in order to be loyal to that tradition, it requires a self-mutilation, which, which the very African feminism that, that helps me live, in fact, demands that I not do. <laughs> and so I'm not answering your question <laughs> because I'm all over the place. But I think that, I think, and, 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 and so why on the, but I also, I'm not completely resolved to the project, right? So, because I think of myself as belonging to an African feminist movement, very unapologetically. At the same time, I think there's something about thinking that a feminist movement looks a certain way that requires that we only look at the mark. When, when you, only, you, you can only make sense of, Paul, or, of Pula or Pumla or the Nine when they are the bodies in the purple shirt as members of One in Nine in ways that in fact require that you pretend they're not also the, 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 these people that we are in this room, <laughs> right? So that's the part of the example that I was trying to use kind of um, the figure of Bucci and Echeta to, 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 to highlight. And I think very often we, 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 we have this strange use of language in, in, in ways that language doesn't work, right? Language doesn't just mean whatever we want it to mean at any given point, right? It comes with this history and it comes with this, with this materiality. And so I'm not answering you, but I guess I'm in conversation with, 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 with what you say. And for my question, I wasn't expecting that one. Um, and, and by the way, I didn't even say the woman's name. Her name is Yasin Bubu, which was bad because I needed to say her name. Um, how do we deal with the erasure without without feminist theory? I mean, I don't know. So that's that's my answer. I I don't know, but then I want to say also that if we can somehow find a way to decolonize feminism and deal with it in the um, grassroots arena, then maybe some feminist theory can be applied to pre-colonial African history in a productive way. Okay, I've got uh, Habiba, then I've got Denai. So is that you've opened up a, a real uh, unnecessary conversation. Um, African feminist history has a, a significant history and I think that the recovery of certain women ruler figures is an important strand of that feminist history and people like Nwando Achebe for instance has done really interesting work in this area, perhaps you know her book. Um, but there are other strands of history that are not attending solely to recovering these figures. But you ask a feminist question by asking why it is that scholars, historians, well-trained as they are, have looked at this archive and not seen it. Right? So I think that history produces these silences and the act of recovering individual figures is important and necessary, but those silences will go on happening if we don't change the way history looks and what history sees. So I think that's if I'm understanding Paula's question, mm -hmm. is, is about, well, how do we do this work if it's not feminist, because we're going to be doing a tiny bit of work, and then the, the larger systemic problem is going to continue. Mm -hmm. So I think that in some ways you, you are asking yourself a feminist question, and there are tools that will help you to do, do that work really powerfully and resonantly, and you're not alone. Um, uh, so forgive me for just responding in <laughs> that way. My actual question, um, because I'm, I'm going to selflessly not ask from that question. But <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I sound long for it, but I'm going to um, ask the, the two scholars who work with Ching Chan Cherries to um, uh, speak a little bit about uh, language in the way that um, Phillips is, is charging English to do work that it hasn't often done in, in dominant English literary culture and how this makes you think about literary studies in South Africa. Why is it that we are still doing English studies, African studies, African language studies, when maybe some of the ways in which such stories work is showing all the time you, 
it's she says we want to translate the people because we can't make a particular category of South African literature subject to oh this must be in the translation category. It, is that not a challenge in fact to our conception of literary studies that it is it is so divided in many disciplines? And um, I'm going to abuse my position and quit Pike on the back of that question. I missed a great chunk of your work, uh, but the whole time you were reading, I wanted to, I wanted to say yes, this is what uh, Zoe Wickham also does. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but then I didn't know how to frame my question without comparing the two. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the question to ask um, in, re in relation to what they both do until you spoke about the post apartheid that the work that Julian Phillips does is to capture the essence of a, a community post apartheid <laughs> need. Um, so perhaps you could tell me the question that I should be asking about the <laughs> 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 And uh, Denai? Oh, the like, yeah. <laughs> um, so both of my comments now echo what's been said, but I still want to say because I was thinking, I wonder what attending so deeply to the form of the short story I'm does in terms of self, so she could only be responding to the canon, when in fact the kind of multiplying of cells might actually use a set of forms to do to engage different audiences and doesn't care about English canons. Because that's not actually it's not it's just one audience, but you're also precise with the thread. So what the how what kind of different question would that be? Um, and and um from that, just a quick I I, I thought because I'm wondering what you do with those of us who are more social scientists than you would like. What would what do you do with us? Um, and because I, I think it's, it's, I think I think there's a way that you it's, it's, you just you move past us in some way. Um, I'm curious. Um, and you need some time to like you know. So I want, I'm curious. And then the funny thing is, I, I want to echo what you said about and follow and say. I mean, it's, for me, for, I mean, I think both. Of, you know the thing in conference you say, I wonder if we wouldn't benefit from it. I'm like, I think so if you would, because so I'm not going to say it like I wonder if you would it. In two ways. One, for me, then I think about, if you're thinking, for instance, how to think about the structure of family um, conceptually in different African contexts, and you can't make or you and I make a, or if you're at my or Moriko, um, or a range of others who follow in terms of thinking. So what it does is that it, then you become the originator. But it does. Because then it, and they're doing family theory and they're not saying let's decolonize it and then come back later. So that naming is not simply to say that I know it and therefore it's not doing what I'm doing. It's, it's precisely to engage in a conversation that populates. It populates a certain, so it places you somewhere that doesn't, because then what you do is then you prioritize a, a kind of white feminism that I don't even know, mm -hmm. right? As, as what white women's history is. And so, but also it impoverishes what you can do in terms of what, I'm, what so rather than the conclusion is that women are valuable, I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 valuable. You know, so it impoverishes also what you're able to do. So, I mean, I'm saying, I'm, like, I'm saying it less politely than the other. <laughs> and then for this round, we'll take the last question. Uh, okay, mine is not a question. Well, mine is a contribution to what uh, Prof presented. I was going to say that um, Roland presented different paradigms of feminism in his work yesterday. Mm -hmm. And then he raised something that I liked and I asked him because I did not get the clarification. So I realized that in African nations, there is a struggle, there is a fight for every woman in different structures. Mm -hmm. So I agree with the editors that you should endeavor to see which, and I think there's like six different types of feminisms mm -hmm. with different branches. So for this study, um, based on what he said, which was very educative for me, um, I think they want you to, to wear some better lenses so that you could see and um, we could have a direction. So mine is actually a contribution to what you raised in your paper. That's okay. Thank you. Can I respond? Okay. Um, thank you guys <laughs> for that. But um, the people that you've mentioned, I referenced all those people in my paper. I guess the editor of the journal didn't think that was good enough because I mean I, st I started with I think it's on your own kid I started with her mm -hmm. then I went to Ife 
at the main. And then Fatou Kamara herself is a, a feminist uh, historian. But I guess I didn't have enough theory for the lady. And for my, in my mind, I wasn't really using feminist theory. I guess I was, though. Because these, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm using all these, these sociologists and historians because my mind is like what you were saying. I have them grouped in, 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 um, in uh, fields and not in, on the feminist side or non-feminist side. But I, I thank you guys for opening something else up, and I'll look further into that. Thank you. Thank you. Ching chong ching. So I'm not sure. Ching chong I'm not sure I fully got your question, but um, I want to wear it. She infuses like um, Afrikaans specific to the Western Cape in her text. So I struggled with it um, simply because I don't speak Afrikaans and it was Afrikaans slang. So I like the way she she used that in her text to give a voice specific to the word. My question Yeah, I, I think that you're right about the specificity. And it's also interesting that that specificity is uh, granted by changing the way English usually appears in South African literature. And so I'm, I'm wondering about the larger questions that this asks of us and doing post apartheid um, South African literature. Whether, whether English accurately describes what we're doing in Afrikaans, so this category, African languages, you know, those are inherited colonial divisions. We've changed our name recently. I'm <laughs> from the English department too, they've got literary studies in English, precisely for that reason. But I think it's been interesting teaching Chin Chin Cherry in Laura of the third year last year. In a course that in South African first apartheid writing, and um, I don't translate for the students, so they're, they're left to make sense of these things themselves. Um, and, and, uh, but I, I think it's a good thing that, that English speakers are actually alienated or feel alienated on occasion by not being able to understand and, and not having the translations or just providing. Think about um, the question was about we can there, there definitely are similarities and um, particularly the notion of arriving in Cape Town and feeling alien and um, receiving an education. Um, but I think the kind of context we can come from is rather different to that of, of um, Joan. Um, and then in terms of the short story cycle, um, what, what I wanted to say, which I didn't, was that increasingly it's been used by by women post-colonial writers as, as a kind of pushback against the linearity of the novel form. Mm -hmm. um, it involves a kind of polyvocality which creates, a, it's a political statement when you give everyone's voices a chance instead of having a single voice. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of potential to, to, to um, do things rather differently and, and to, to not conform to what the canonical expectation expectations are of what a novel is or what a short story is, but to do something with like both and um, therefore it's a very interesting thing. Um, and it actually acts out the relationship between identity and community because what you have is a unit, which is the whole, but you have individual stories which can stand on their own. Um, I like your question. And I about it wasn't my question, but I liked the question <laughs> for my for my um, literary critic peers around 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 genre. It made me think of it made me think of what Zaxi Da says about 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 some of the ways in which we both from inside the literary studies space, but also from when we do other things outside of that. Um, do with 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 kind of some of this vocabulary and this and, and this genre. So, for example, you know, he's, he's not an African feminist necessarily, but okay, I'll say I'll tell the story like quick thing. 
Um, so, for example, you know, a lot of his work, for when he came out, when he started writing in, in, in novel form, people kept saying, oh, you do magic realism. And he kept saying, no. <laughs> and I said, but it is. And he said, no, I don't do magic realism. And they said, but it is. You like very Latin American-esque. And he'd go, well, no. Well, that's very nice, but no. <laughs> and then he, you know, he says often, and you can believe him or not believe him, that he, that he read Marquez after this accusation, right? Mm -hmm. So the assumption is that you're writing in that tradition, which politically makes sense in a global sense, an international sense, but in fact, there's a way in which, and of course our training, because we as literary scholars, we know what magic realism is, when we encounter a text like that, we see magic realism. And he was saying, yes, but I come from a context in which stories come in this form. I didn't know magic realism until people kept accusing me of magic realism, right? Which, which is a nice accusation, not a bad accusation, but the point is that's not what I was doing. I couldn't, I couldn't, and not in a crude sense of like, I can't be influenced by something that I don't know exists in the world, because you can, right? Mm -hmm. But, but in a sense of, well, actually, I was, I was doing something entirely different. And of course, as, 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 as scholars, you can read it in however way you want. So what Sue was saying about that thing, well, of course, you remember also that, that, that big debate with, with Wickham when, 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 when um, You Can't Get Lost in Cape Town first came out in literary studies about how do we read it as linked short stories? Is it gesturing towards the novel? Is it <laughs> short stories that do something else? And, and, and I mean, it was, it, was, it was a fantastic disagreement, right? Because it was about exactly what you're saying about the sense of, well, is it either this or that? And is it actually more complicated to say it's, it's this, that, and that? Or is there a yet another level, right? Mm -hmm. so, so for example, we say, well, maybe it, we can read it as both. And certainly when I've taught it, I've taught it as, well, either or and both. And, 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 but, but I'm wondering increasingly whether there isn't a third. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's not either or, it's not, well, maybe it is either or. Maybe it's also either or and both, but maybe there's something else altogether that it's creating. Mm -hmm. And so when we, you know, so, so that's, that's the question that, that, that's, that's what your question sparked off in me, then I, about, about, about the work that genre does and what it means for us to say, well, this is resisting that and create, and, 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 and in the line of that. Well, yes, of course, maybe, but maybe there's something else we're missing because we're so married to the idea of, of, of it looking like something else that we know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of what do I do with the social scientists? Mm -hmm. What do you do with those of us who are more social scientists <laughs> than we'd like to be? Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think this is the work this is the challenge for me, exactly. Because I know that as African feminists who work in very different well, academics, who work in, uh, African feminists in, 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 in different academies on the continent, that we work both often in our disciplines and, in, and, 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 and do this interdisciplinary work, right? And we read each other in ways that, that we're not supposed to, but we do anyway. Mm -hmm. But we often, I, the discomfort now is about how we do that reading, right? So we read each other in the way where we read secondary sources. And, and, and it seems to me that in fact, when we do that work, the part of the work that, uh, that very work that we're reading across disciplines actually invites us to do is to do the next thing, right? So we're reading each other as secondary material, mm -hmm. but we're not reading, we, 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 we are averting our own gaze from the theorization that's happened, even as we are writing literary criticism that says the novel, the African feminist novel theorizes in certain ways, the South African contemporary feminist theory theorizes in certain ways, we're not reading the theory in, 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 in Andrade in the way that we read the theory in other places where, where, where we readily go to for theory. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm, I'm doing with, the, with, with, those of, with those of us not me, because I'm not a social scientist. Those of us who are more social scientists than we would like to be, the same thing I'm trying to do with those of us who are literary scholars but do this messy work of, of, of being really romantically attached to, to discipline, but also being incredibly disloyal to discipline, right? And, 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 and also just say, so, so I guess that's what I'm doing. I'm doing the same thing to the social scientists that I'm trying to do to myself and the art historians, right? 
and saying, well, maybe, maybe we have the language to do some of the stuff that we're grappling with if we would stop treating it as, as secondary material when, it, when we stop treating all of it as just secondary material when some of it is actually theoretical, conceptual work. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So what happens if I recognize that that, that, that Andrade is theorizing something, that Baderun, when Baderun is, when, when, that ambiguous visibility is not a concept, it's not, it's not just a thing that she sees where she sees it, that there's actually really serious theoretical work that is happening there if I sit with what ambiguous visibility does mm -hmm. and what leaking of meaning does. It's not just untidiness. <laughs> Although untidiness is nice too. <laughs> Conceptually. Conceptually. <laughs> okay, in the same time. Mm. Um, all right. Everybody in Ugafi says time up. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I ask people to continue the conversations as you walk to lunch, right? Mm.